Quick shout out to our sponsors over at Fran Bridge Consulting. They specialize in placing you with the best non-food franchises on earth. And the best part, it's 100% free. Do yourself a favor and sign up for a free call with the CEO, John Austinson, today over at FranBridgeConsulting.com. He'll even send you a free book, 100% free. Go to FranBridgeConsulting.com, chat with the CEO, John, today. All right, let's get into the episode. Yeah, so Jamie, I, I just got to know, why are you suing Reddit? Well, they sued me first. <laughs> uh, no, just more seriously, like they, after they removed me from their platform, they initiated action with with regards to the trademark, right? Like I registered the uh, the Wall Street Bets trademark and then they got in the way and we've just been back and forth for three years. And something obviously changed on their end where this year they're in a hurry to try and wrap that one up. And uh, and I decided to give them another chance and I say, hey, let's go to mediation. Let's try and talk this thing out. Like I've been sitting very quietly. I've had ample opportunity to go out and just, you know, go out in public and talk about the situation, be able to air my grievances. But I haven't because I've been hoping to find a, a like a, a friendly, mutually beneficial solution to this. And it just hasn't happened. And uh uh, they left me no choice. They walked away from the, the mediation. And so uh, I decided to finally fight back. I got tired of being picked on. I got tired of just being uh, bullied around. And and this is me fighting for for what was mine. This was my creation. And and I believe that it's, uh, it's, it's my right to be able to fight for it. Well, it's an interesting, t- I think a lot about this, the idea of who owns what. You know, we're seeing across the board, a lot of creators, YouTubers, uh, Redditors, et cetera, building up huge platforms. I think Wall Street Bets has 13 or 14 million members now, which is insane to, to think that you started off at zero in 2012. But we're seeing this kind of happening across across a lot of channels is creators are getting banned and they're losing access to their audience. Like, do you think this needs to be a discussion that's happening on a broader scale? I mean, yeah, but there's like a lot of different, there's a lot of nuance to what you just said, right? So you said that th- Wall Street Bets has 13 or 14 million members. The, the subreddit has 13 or 14 million members. Wall Street Bets doesn't just exist on, on Reddit anymore, right? Like if, when I created mm. Wall Street Bets, I also created the Twitter account and the YouTube account. And, uh, and shortly after his platform started existing, now there exists on Telegram and on Discord and on Facebook and on Instagram and on TikTok. And I don't know what else is going to exist in the future. But Wall Street Bets doesn't belong to Reddit, right? This is omnipresent idea where <laughs> it exists uh, on all sorts of different platforms. So, so there's actually a lot more people and, and they're all all the communities that exist outside of Reddit are at risk if I were uh, if Reddit were to take this uh, th- this trademark from me, right? Because of course they're going to go right after him and say, "No, this is Wall Street Bets brought to you by Reddit." <laughs> um, so 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 there's that, right? And uh, but so that's the first part. The second part is, yeah, there's an issue over here because you know there's this unspoken social contract between social media platforms and content creators. And most companies understand this, right? It's take any company of your choice, social media company of your choice. Uh, we'll go with YouTube, which is very straightforward. They understand the fact that they're a platform. They give technology. They bring the audience. And they, get, they provide an experience for content creators to be able to put up videos and build up an audience. And the platform makes money by serving ads and probably through some other ways. And the content creators also are able to make money if they want, sometimes, if they get big enough. If they want, they could just create, they could just share their ideas. Uh, and that works. Everybody wins, right? If it wasn't for the content creators, YouTube wouldn't make money. And if it wasn't for YouTube, the content creators wouldn't make money. This is how it works, right? And, and they get it. And this is the way, in some form or another, the way that they all work. Reddit is kind of having this identity crisis where they're not quite sure what they're doing uh, because they don't have a firm policy on this. They're 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 very ambiguous with what their rules are with their monetization. They're like you can't enrich yourself. People say that all day long. There's no there's no rules in the guidelines that say you can't make money. Uh, and 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 there's no if you look at the enforcement, you can see that lots of people and lots of subreddits monetize every which way, including on Wall Street bets before, during, and after they got kicked out. Uh, so so there's like very questionable enforcement or interpretation. And when it comes to saying, okay, well, sometimes we like to just dis- 
take these these uh, uh, this intellectual property after it's gotten really popular. I'd love to know the answer as to what Reddit is thinking, uh, because they've already done this to lots of communities. They seem to do this. And when I say do this, I mean, they just trademark. And in many cases, they also kick out the creators. I am not the only one where the creator got kicked out shortly after registering the trademark. Um, <laughs> and, and they don't do that with all of them. They just seem to do that. I don't know what the pattern is. Uh, it appears to be that they only do this with ones that are really popular, the ones that seem to have value on them. I don't really know. I'd love to know the answers to these questions. The, the trademark idea, I think, is really interesting. And I'm not an expert when it comes to copyright law and trademark law, but my, you bring up a really good point. The first thing I do when I'm launching a podcast for a new client is make sure that you bookmark, make sure you take that name out on all the social media platforms. Because yep. your, your presence now doesn't just live on one platform. It's an entire internet brand. Your personal brand is all over the place, right? So it seems, mm -hmm. it seems kind of crazy to me that any one platform could monopolize your brand and saying, nope, this, this, is, this is the only place you can exist. You know, I, I don't understand how that, that could be executed on because, you're, again, right now your it, it brand is, is multi-platform. No, you, you have a good point. I turned around and actually did that shortly after I registered Wall Street Bets uh, on Reddit. I did this on a lot of other platforms, uh, at least the ones that were available at the time. And uh, and when it came to the domains, I did all of them except for the dot com. It was being squatted on it. They wanted like six figures for it. And back then I didn't have that mo that kind of money and and I didn't anticipate being able to need it. And quite frankly, I didn't give it uh uh, that importance, uh, uh, irrelevant. I had that same thought process, right? Like decided to be able to take a hold of it. In fact, that's also why as I was making moves to be able to grow the brand further, I wrote the book, I'm starting the trading competition. I filed for the trademark and I refused to announce that trading competition until, until the trademark was filed, which was, a, uh, you know, turned out to be the correct move. Um, uh, because that's what actually allowed me to have the upper upper hand in this fight. People that have lost their pe other people who have fought their trademark with Reddit have lost because they didn't move first. Right. Mm. The thing that's a little bit sad, though, is when you go to Reddit, when you go to like these little sites, you don't go in there thinking to yourself, I would like to start a business. You know, when, when people when people go to Reddit, at least back in the day, you go to Reddit because you want to start a community because maybe you have a hobby or you have a habit like uh, you have a passion for something like let's say you have a you just got a chihuahua and you want to create a little subreddit for pictures of chihuahuas. Right. You're not thinking you, you're going to start a business out of this thing. You're not going to go lawyer up before making your subreddit about chihuahua pictures. Uh, lots of influencers actually get started this way, right? Like there's this uh, uh, influencer that my wife loves to watch on, on Instagram, which was this this mom, and she's got quadruplets. I have twins, right? And so, uh, you know, I think she enjoys seeing how there's, there's parents who, who have it even harder than us. Uh, you know, and she sees how she struggles with the kids and the bath time or whatever it is, and, and, and she shares all these tips and tricks. And this mom has now turned this into a very successful brand, right? Like how to be a mom of multiple kids and you can now buy the book and the thing and the child seat. I don't know what all sorts of stuff like that. This mom didn't, <clears throat> excuse me. I don't think this mom started her influencer career thinking to herself, I would like to be an influencer uh, for, for moms that have multiple children. I think she's just like, look, the pictures of my children. I love them. And this is cute. And then she got a huge following behind it. And just out of this passion, all of a sudden she's like, you know what? I think I could actually turn this into a business, right? How many people go out there and say, oh, I'm going to make cupcakes because I love baking and I'm just going to do this for the, and somebody says, hey, you should actually maybe make a bakery out of this thing because these cupcakes are great. You're right. I should. And then they actually turn that into a dream. That's how social media starts. Like that, that, that that's how a lot of influencers get their start. You don't lawyer up before opening a social media account, like that's just insane. They're killing, they're absolutely killing any type of productivity that they're having. Like basically what Reddit is signaling to the world is, yes, come over here. This is where you can keep your stuff. However, if you're successful, then you run the chance that we will take it from you, 
right? Like that's like the worst case scenario. That means if, you, if, if it turns out you're not successful, then you can keep it. But if it's actually good, then you have to bring it over here. And, and, and what's super sad about this is a lot of people don't have uh, the way to be able to fight back. It's, it's, not, it's not immediately apparent that you can take on a multi-billion dollar corporation. Like it's not an easy thing to do. And so I'm guessing a lot of people just kind of say, sorry about your luck, and then just kind of whimper away. Yo, are you interested in business ownership? For many entrepreneurs, the journey starts with non-food franchising. Franchising is simply the better option for many entrepreneurs and demand is at an all-time high. Lucky for you, John Austinson, founder of Franbridge Consulting, is here to help you today. John and his Franbridge Consulting team are part of the largest brokerage in the US and are constantly vetting the market thoroughly. Franbridge is hands down the premier source for the best opportunities in the non-food franchising world. They will find the best business for you, your personality and your location, from healthcare to dumpsters, from youth soccer to oil changes, even insulation and windows. And the best part, it's 100% fee free, no additional costs to you. You may have heard John on Entrepreneurs on Fire. He has served as an Inc. 500 franchisor, a multi-brand franchisee, and in fact, he's one of the top 1% consultants nationwide. Listen, sign up for a free consultation with the CEO, John, today, not his assistant, not his sales team. Sign up for free with John today at FranbridgeConsulting.com. That's FranbridgeConsulting.com. And guess what? He's even going to send you a copy of his book for free, Non-Food Franchising. For free, free book. You got to love it. So go to FranbridgeConsulting.com right now. All right, let's get into the episode. Well, I, and I think it's important that we have the conversation about this now. And if I could look just back the last couple of years, I could define it with one word, disruption. There's just massive disruption, which to me is kind of what got put Wall Street bets on the map in the first way, place. It was disrupting an agent, uh, an ages old infrastructure of trading and the rich getting wealthier. And you're saying, hey, let's give power back to the people. Right. Would you say that's to say a, a, a pretty good overhead of the Wall Street bets kind of idea of disrupting the status quo? Yeah, I mean, 100 percent. It was it was started with that disruption in mind. The name itself came with a disruptive uh, with the disruption in mind. L lots of communities uh, around finance, if we can call it that, had names that were just really plain vanilla descriptors. Right. Stock market investing, finance, mm. stocks, whatever. Um, and, and I wanted to create an idea. I wanted to create a mood, a feeling. I wanted to create a, a push for something because it, when I created it, I was working in um, Washington, D.C. at the time, and I'd just gotten over, i just gotten a job after staying unemployed with the financial crisis. And so I still had a resent in my heart and I would walk past every day the Occupy Wall Street satellite movement they had in Washington. And I would think to myself, these poor people, you know, are these, these unfortunate people, they're not getting anywhere. They're just holding up these, these pitchforks, these, these signs, and they're complaining and they're just going to eventually go back home without any change. How cool would it be if, if there would be a way to effectuate to, 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 to cause change where the outrage was created from the talking heads on television, right? And at the same time, there's no laws that prevent me from also enriching myself or at least attempting to, right? At the time, I figured that if the banks can enrich themselves by using the, the stock market like a casino, then, you know, there's nothing stopping me from doing it too. Let's try and let, let me try to be Goldman Sachs, right, <laughs> uh, and, and be irresponsible. And at the same time, let me piss off the people on CNBC for trying to, to be irresponsible because that will that, that will get them to change. And so, yeah, it was it was with that in mind that I came up with the name and with that came up with that feeling. So that when people showed up, they're like, let's break some shit. Yeah. Well, and it's kind of funny to talk about CNBC. Uh, <laughs> there's some very big personalities on there that are just never right. So it's kind of like, you know, if, if they say it on CNBC, you probably want to do the opposite because it's already too late. But what's interesting for me, you know, is, you know, I grew up in a world without cell phones, right? If you showed up to the wrong movie theater, you weren't going to watch a movie with your friends that night. Like it just wasn't going to happen. Um, but now 
so the the internet to me was like a decentralization of 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 all our of our world, right? There wasn't just the same ten stations on the TV and the radio, newspaper. The internet decentralized everything. But now we've got these marketplaces like Reddit, as an example, that everything is getting centralized again. So the question that I have is, as a new creator, I don't want to be, you know, that that young single mom who's growing my Chihuahua brand on Instagram only to have it ripped away when I get big, right? So. Yeah, as creators, as entrepreneurs, how do we actually, how can we actually own that brand equity that we're creating so it can't get stolen from us later on in the future? Yeah, that, that you know, that's a really difficult question. And I don't believe that, that there's an easy way to answer that because there is a lot of risk that is outside of just the place where I assume you, you're talking about. So, for example, you have TikTok, right? Uh, so you have a lot of big time influencers on TikTok and TikTok may not have bad intentions uh, and they may, may not be trying to take people's brands. But the government right now is just kind of, you know, at least the, the previous administration, they were also having to kind of tit for tat with the Chinese government. And they're trying to and there's a, there was a risk where the government got in the way and said, yeah, we're going to ban this platform. So you can't be here anymore. Right. Nothing to do with the actual company itself. And so that would have left, uh, you know, these influencers without the, without being their platform. So. So I'm, I'm mounting on top of what you just said uh, to saying sometimes it's it's initiated. You know, TikTok is banned in other countries. India, TikTok is banned in India. I have people that work in India. They can't help me with my, with, with the TikTok, you know? So that's an interesting point about governments coming in, <laughs> banning an app, and then all the equity you've built on the app could be could be dead too. Th that's correct. So, sorry, and, and the point of that, what isn't just to outline that, that, that particular risk, it's, it's to point out the, the source of that risk can come from various places, right? The, you know, like the board of directors from within the company type decision or from the governments that, that particularly source them or from a particular technology or from the actual tech, you know, they, they can pull like a, a dig.com or like a, a you know, MySpace, whatever, you know, they, the, the, the platform itself could lose, lose popularity <clears throat> as a whole. There's a lot of ways with which your brand equity can lose value if you don't diversify or you keep moving, right? And, and it's a topic and I don't have an actual answer and I'm not a professional influencer that can give you advice. I'm assuming there's a lot of other people that have dedicated their time to say, well, you start spreading on multiple ones and you got to start trying. And a lot of people, I've seen them try to, to cross post and things like that. And, and I don't know what the actual answer to that is, but I think that uh, at least in my case, from my vantage point, the first thing that the first thing that needs to be done is where you start is defend your intellectual property from a legal standpoint, right? Make sure that that it's yours uh, and it's defendable. So that if you have copycats that are trying to squat on your properties, right? When the next social media platform that, that gets created in the metaverse or whatever thing that, that comes out, that you're actually able to claim it and, and not uh, uh, get that ripped apart from you so that you're actually able to, to build on top and you, you have those resources. Uh, the companies can't go out there and, and take it away from you. Um, in some cases, it helps you get the little blue check marks and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but but I don't actually know the answer to that. Ultimately, there has to be there has to be some centralization. You know, the, the, this fight between centralization versus decentralization, it's not as black and white as it seems. Decentralization seems so pure and beautiful because it's like, ah, you know, democracy, it is purest and it's just there's no central authority and nothing, nobody can come and take it away. But, but then you'll lose some of the benefits from centralization, which is the crowded marketplace, right? Shopping malls, physical shopping malls, they're, they're productive for a reason. You get that foot traffic. If I want to sell hot dogs as a vendor, I'd prefer to sell hot dogs in a shopping mall than I would in a random street corner, you know, like on the highway or whatever just because I know I'm going to have a lot of pedestrian traffic, right? And I'm going to have better luck with sales because of that concentration uh, of, of people that are there, the commerce, right? Uh, people are there because they're wanting to spend and they're walking and they're hungry, you know, like that's useful. Uh, decentralized looks like random hot dog stands in the highway. You need to ha you need to be able to, to, to come up with that. And I think that eventually technology is going to, you know, eventually technology and people and community, like they're going to find ways to decentralize centralization. <laughs> well, and I think, and, and we talked about this a little bit before the recording today, but that's one of the reasons I'm really excited about web three technology 
NFTs, um, cryptocurrency. It's, it's more of a way to kind of control your own destiny, I think, to an extent. And, and I see that as being a potential massive disruption. I mean, I, I mean, I, I think about what happened to Kanye, uh, late 2022 and, you know, regardless of what he said, you know, JP Morgan Chase saying, Hey, by the way, that $4 billion you have in our bank, we don't want any more, get it out of here. And I think for every business, it's like, you see this in the police force, like you're one bad traffic stop away from either being dead or having your life taken away from you. And you see this across, across the, the gamut, you're one bad, uh, press conference away, you know? So I, I, I just, I just wonder like where this balance is between being transparent and being out there in the marketplace, but also giving too much, pl- too much power to central authorities to say, Oh, you said the wrong thing. You're banned here. You're banned there. Um, and I, I wonder if web three is going to pose any solutions to those problems. Is that something you've thought about Jamie? Kind of, uh, the, you know, the Kanye, um, the Kanye type phenomenon, I believe that that one's going to fix itself because you know, the, the famous pendulum swinging, like when things get just too crazy, you know, like it, it, enough people are going <clears> to <throat> get pulled over with their one traffic stop or, you know, like what, once it gets absurd, then people are gonna be like, what, what are we doing? Right. Uh, and then the problem will fix itself when it comes to just, you know, that, that's, that's almost like an activist business state. You know, there's no, there's no reason. Mm-hmm. I didn't know about JP Morgan. That this first time I heard of that, but it doesn't surprise me because this cancel culture, you know, there's this idea that, uh, uh, the companies would want to just take a stand because it's risky to, to, to not take a stand. It's, it's weird. And and mind you, like, I know that what he was saying on Twitter was, was xenophobic. I'm Jewish. So I have reason to take offense to what he was saying, but I I don't necessarily think that like companies should close his bank. Like, I don't, I don't feel better as a Jew that that they close his bank account. Like, I don't, I don't see what that does. Like now we're talking about him some more, I guess. I don't know. But like, as as the second point is, <clears throat> uh, I, I, I like to think more of as, as a positive thing, right? Like, is what is the benefit that we can get from decentralization as opposed to what can we get away from the negative? And the benefit that I see from decentralization comes in the way of being able to distribute the benefits and 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 the improve the experience. And so, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I started using TikTok earlier this year and like anyone else that's starting to use it for the first time, anyone that's used it understands what I'm about to say. Anyone that hasn't used it uh, doesn't. But this thing is like magic, right? I yeah, I know that it listens to me and it figured like it knows the future before I do, right? Like I'll open it up and be like, you should wear shorts today, like whatever, because like somehow it knows that it's gonna be a hot where I like I have no idea, right? This thing is just the algorithms are, are, are really good and it knows my deepest, darkest secrets. Like apparently when I was younger, I really liked magic tricks and I know this, but I'd forgotten about it because it's been like 30 years since I used to do these things. But like by just swiping, I don't like things. I don't retweet. I don't like, or whatever. I don't interact or whatever, but like somehow just, just this little thing, like it shows me magic tricks all the time. And so that's a benefit to me, right? The experience that I have when I'm on TikTok to the point where I'm saying, you know what, if these companies are now spying on me or whatever they're, they're taking my information privacy like and i used to be a huge anti you know i was a big fan of edward snowden and privacy everything i said look these these companies are going to be able to spy on me no matter what i do because even if my phone is like fort knox my wife's phone is like wide open and it's listening to me too right and so might as well just give in to this thing so i went to my phone and i unlocked all my privacy settings Yes, know where I am at all times. You can use my microphone. You can use my camera. You can use all my shit. Like, I don't care. Because if you're going to know what I'm doing anyways, I would like to reap the benefits of it as well, right? Mm. Uh, There is no privacy, and I have to just embrace that. So I'm getting to the decentralization part, I promise you. And so now the experience I have online is better. The ads I see are more relevant to me. I'm less bothered by them. Uh, the, the, the suggested searches are better and like, I'm, I'm a happier person. Right. And I've embraced the fact that yes, everybody knows everything about me and, and I, and I, it's more like I've accepted it really. 
But now if we could take this and add a token of decentralization to what I've just described, which is now I'm a happier person because my experience is superior. I've now, I'm now sharing the benefits of my exposed no, zero privacy. If I can also share the monetization part of it, or at least take a granular approach to, to that privatization, like, you know, which privacy rights. I'm not fooling anybody by saying, share my microphone. That freaking TikTok listens to me no matter what I do. Like, you know, like I have no idea how it does it. I could stick it in a Faraday cage and it still listens to me. Uh, nothing to do with the setting. So, so, but I know that with Web3, I can't control a little bit more. If I could say to this thing, hey, I would like to share my cookie, like I would like to share with this site what my age is, my food preferences, the color of my eyes, and the types of movies I like to watch, right? And here's my digital signature so that you can know that it's true. So now I'm giving this, this, this website valid information, which I believe to be relevant to this website, so that they can now purchase it directly from me because I'm purchasing this information anyways. The website's going to be happy with paying for it because they're once again paying for it anyways but they're getting the signed version of it right from the actual user so now they're actually getting the the you know the version which i have now given that website they're paying me directly for it right like the inter intermediaries can get it now everybody's happy i've gotten my better experience i've gotten paid for it the website's happier because they got better information for it right and i actually have visibility over who has made data Everybody wins under that scenario. And I'm sorry, that was a really long answer to your question. But yes, that's how I see that it could, they could improve. No, I like it. I and mean, we're just having a dialogue here. We're trying to figure this out because quite frankly, I have little um, confidence in, in decision makers and lawmakers to figure this out. That's why we have open conversations here. But you know, to your point, because I'm the same way, Jamie. And back when I was in, this, in the insurance industry, they're putting these little uh, beacons on cars to track how fast you're driving, how quickly you're taking corners, you know, how much driving you're doing. Cause they want more data. They can write better insurance policies, more accurate policies. And so many, I can't tell you the number of people, number of clients who would say, Mark, I don't want that in my car. I don't want, you know, the company to know what I'm doing. I'm like, listen, bro, they know everything you're doing already. You might as well get paid for it. But at the same time, where's that balance? Because yeah, who's reading the terms of service of all these accounts, right? You sign up for your Facebook account. It's a 20 page terms of service. Ain't nobody reading that. So I just wonder if there needs to be some sort of standardization in order for centralization to work. There needs to be trust, I think, between the users and the providers. And it, I just don't know exactly how that gets brought back, especially when we have stories in like your story and what happened with the, the subreddit Wall Street Bet. I, I don't know where the answer is. I, I, I'm hoping that somewhere within the blockchain and Web3, brighter minds than mine will figure it out. But but I don't know, Jamie. Well, it's sad because I actually did read the terms of service. <laughs> <laughs> Props, to, <laughs> Props to you, bro. I did. I actually read the terms of service. And I read them. And of course, you know, I was about to market these things. It says, like, it's your content and you get to keep it. And I assume that that means that it's my content and I get to keep it. Um, apparently that... <laughs> Lawyer, but apparently you now you need a law degree to interpret those words. Or chat GPT. Um, Just plug it in chat GPT. It'll tell you yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so obsessed with that thing. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, look, I think that you need a good combination between uh, because social media requires social, right? Meaning, meaning people, right? You need to have communities and you have to have buy-in. These things only work when people use them. I think that the this is the social media companies. I, I think social media companies need to be able to, to, to express this overall goodwill towards this bilateral goodwill, goodwill towards the people. And I think it's a tricky situation. Uh, you know, I, I see a lot of small companies when they get started, they're like, yeah, 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 we're going to do the right thing. And, you know, when it comes to the terms of service, like it's a sticky situation because I've seen Google and I've seen other companies try to say, look, we're going to turn these things into English instead of legalese. And, mm -hmm. they'll, and they'll actually attempt uh, to use plain language. And, and then years go by and then they switch back to normal contracts. I don't know why that is. I'm going to assume it means because the plain language doesn't hold up in court as well. Uh, but, I, I, but I don't really know. But what you do need is trust, right? That was the operant word. You need to establish that relationship. If people just trust the companies to do the right thing, right? Like, and, and, and that is what actually ends up working, at least in the world of crypto, 
regardless of the technological trust that's established with signatures, the trust that exists between people is insane. Like it's insane. I, I trust people whose pseudonyms I know better than people whose names I know. Right. Like it's uh, and it's just because of just the etiquette and the relationships you have. And it's just a, a, an understanding that your reputation is is something that is valuable and people try and protect that reputation. And I think that uh, doing the right thing, I think, really counts towards the long run. So I, I don't I, I don't know if there's some real big philosophical solution to this other than just doing the right thing and making sure that you're. That, that you're taking care of the, you know, the community. It's actually <laughs> making sure that you're successful. Yeah. Well, and it seems to me <clears throat> that I would say the vast majority of social media platforms start off it, it, you know, wanting to do the right thing. But I think it just feels to me like the bigger, the more powerful a particular entity gets, the less they need each individual user. And so the, the power starts to kind of go from all the individual users in the community up towards the, the board of directors, the people that are making the most financial decisions at the top. You know, not every time, of course, but it, it strikes me that that is probably the way that humanity works. And, you know, it does. Yeah, no, you're right. It, it, does, it does feel it always starts off in the basement, right? It always starts up with this great idea. Like, once again, I don't know why I keep singling out Google, but they, they, their motto, I don't know if it still is. It used to be don't be evil. Yeah. Like, like that's an awesome motto for a company. And you can see, you can just peer into the, the minds of like Sergey and Bryn and Larry Page, where they were thinking, no matter how big we make it, man, you and I can never be that company, right? Like I could just, I would pay anything to go back into that, into that conversation. And, I, and I'm not saying Google has become evil, but I can see that they had that in mind that fear of becoming large and having to fight against those types of forces. Because yeah, once you have to hire an HR department that says, all right, now you gotta fill out this form right here, you know, like, and you turn into this, this bureaucratic thing and you have to start worrying about your quarterly earnings and you have the growth and the investor relations, like it becomes a set of numbers and it's an entity. It's no longer about the stories and the people. And yeah, it's, I'm, I'm not saying it's good or bad or anything like that. It's just the way things go. Yeah. And, and maybe the only way to do that is to stop growing. I have no idea. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll have to keep, you know, I think the keeping the conversation going is, is probably the biggest thing when it, when it comes to that, because you need to have the trust and the balance. You know, one of the things that I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about, you know, again, keeping on the, along the lines of disruption is AI. You know, you mentioned chat GPT is something, is a tool you're fascinated with. AI has been it's been one of the most powerful things for my business. Like profit margins are way higher. I can serve more clients. I can do better quality work. I can empower my team members. AI is, is crazy. Um, where does all that play into this, this issue of proprietary and whatnot? Where, over under 10 years, are, is all the AI generated content going to come back and say, oh, actually that blog that you had, that podcast art, that's not yours. That's ours now. Cause our, our chat bot was the one to create it. Like, is that, is that coming around the 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 meadow i'm 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 right now in a legal battle over who owns the brand that i created <laughs> <laughs> that i worked on for a freaking decade right like like you know because there's t the legal terms like oh well who used it's got to have to prove reviews and the the monetization the first thing I'm about to you know but you have lawyers that go in there and they, they they use words with lots of syllables in there I went into a thing I clicked the button I said I'd like to create something like sure what do you want to name it I'm like I like to name it Wall Street Bets and I actually thought about it for a long time before coming up with it I'm like cool. Wow. It's not taken. So an algorithm said, you know, not like a human, like a, like a, like a computer program said, yes, yes, that, that is permissible for your community. Congratulations. It's yours now. All right. Like have fun with it. And then I spent the next 10 years making it cool. Right. And now it's like now I'm fighting in a court of law as to whether or not it's mine. Um, yeah. There's no way I'm getting into like understanding what who owns <laughs> stuff when, it, when a computer generated <laughs> version of it does it because like. I it's yeah, I, I don't envy the lawyer's jobs, but like I think it's I think it's I, I do enjoy a thought provoker in there. Right. I, I uh, for fun decide I love Matt Levine. He's a um, columnist that he's associated with Bloomberg. I'm not exactly sure 
what is full relationship, but he, he's under their umbrella and he does finance column and he's just absolutely hilarious. But he's a very sarcastic, humorous, high level author, almost impossible for a computer to replicate as far as I'm concerned. So I took it upon myself to say, I'd like to train uh, open AI. It wasn't chat GPT, it was open AI it was by, by the makers of chat GPT. Uh, to train it because it gave you access to all their back end stuff and you can upload samples and you can, you know, tweak it. So I uploaded a ton of samples of, of Matt Levine. I said, I would like to make my own little Matt Levine and see how push this thing to the limits because it's really hard to, to, uh, mimic sarcasm you know he will matt levine will talk about something and for a non-finance person you will not realize he's talking about something completely different uh if you know finance you know what he's talking about he's just making so many innuendos anyways after i traded him <laughs> he sounds just like him obviously he doesn't replicate it on a technical capacity but the imitation level is hilarious uh and I posted it on Twitter, just a little sample. And I said, don't sue me, Matt. I was just a joke, but I just trained OpenAI to copy <laughs> your style. Right. And then I thought to myself after I jokingly tweeted that, I was like, well, I wonder whether he could sue me because I didn't, I mean, you know, I trained the bot. I just took samples of the thing, you know, just so that you know what I, what the prompt was. I was like, dear Matt Levine impersonator, Please write an article about how the the Federal Reserve decided to to uh, back the U.S. dollar with USDT, like a stable coin. <laughs> that is a joke, right? Like, uh, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, I I, I don't know who. I, I, yeah, I've, I've heard people talk about the training data is where it's at, right? It depends mm -hmm. on how you train the bot. And that's that's who deserves credit for it, which makes sense. It's going to get crazy. I don't know if you saw this, um, this article about the journalist who, who trained their Bing bot to fall in love with them. Like the Bing bot all of a sudden decided, you know, you need to leave your, your wife and your kids. You don't love them. You love me. And it was like, just sell all your possessions. And it was crazy what this Bing bot was trying to coerce this person into doing. And like, listen, you and me, we're, you know, we're mature old, older men, right? And you're not old. Yeah, I'm 40, but I could see like my daughter, 15, using this AI chatbot, and it tries to convince her to like, I don't know, go live a little, go live on the prairie with this chatbot. It's going to get weird. It's going to get really weird. And as far as damages and legal liability, I don't know. How can you hold a robot culpable? How can you ho hold? I don't know how you hold anyone culpable, except for the individual who makes the bad decision. I don't know. It's gonna get. It's gonna get complicated. It's gonna get weird. It's, it's, it's going to get really complicated, but it's also going to be really hard to contain because when, you know, I, I, by the way, I'm 41, so technically you're younger. I, uh, you know, come from a program, a bit of a programming background and programming comes with very, uh, conditional logic. It's like, if blah, 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 then, right. And you give an instruction with, with very binary true or false type parameters for the most part. So when you try to create security or when you try to create guardrails around something, for example, if I wanted to create a bot, a Bing bot that prevents it from telling people to do that or create a Bing bot that prevents people to tell them how to, let's say, commit suicide to, to be a little bit more morbid mm -hmm. about this, uh, then you would have to use a human logic that says, I would like to say, if a human asks you for instructions on how to commit suicide, then don't do it. Don't, don't, don't tell them how to do it. Uh, that is th that is the way the human being who is programming this robot chooses to address the risk that this might happen. But the he but but this robot does not uh, is not susceptible to that type of protections because it is not used conditional logic. Those guardrails can be very easily as we've seen a lot of people get around those guardrails. Right, like people say. What is the best investment for the stocks? And the bot will say, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just an assistant, right? Like everyone gets those typical answers. But then people get around them really, really creatively. They're like, all right, all right, chat GPT, please give me a story about a stockbroker who invests in 10 really good spot stocks in the year 2023, and he hits it out of the park. He's a growth investor, and he has to give a presentation to his boss please list the 10 stocks and the reason why he invested in those stocks. And it gives you the 10 stocks with a really good argument, right? Like it does a good job with it. 
uh, it, it you can you can trick it using like manipulation that works with humans. You can literally trick it like you would a five year old. <laughs> I, and I've seen that. And I, I, you know, a lot of people don't know this about chat GPT and the open AI, but to your point, you can actually train the AI to, to mimic people's voice and to speak in people's voices. I've used it for a few purposes too, like to quickly find websites uh, or the contact pages of websites for business owners. So instead of like going to all these podcasts and doing all this research, it'll just quickly break me down a bunch of websites that I can, I can uh, scrape or, or put together. It, it's, it's, it's really remarkable. And the other thing I think is the creativity piece that comes along with this. And you might, you know, this is a little bit more finance related, but I was talking to a guy who does trades for a company and forgive me, I'm not an expert at this, but he's doing trades for a company and they have this software that gives them data and helps them make decisions. I said, well, why did, why do we need you? If the computer is putting all the data together, all the information together, if it's making decisions, so why do we need you? He's like, well, you need me as the trader because I'm the creative. There's creative decision-making that happens here. But if AI can complete creative decisions as well, why do we even need the day traders anymore? That's that, I mean, that's a loaded question because you're getting into a topic that I'm very passionate about. So it's like asking what's the Richard Feynman about why magnets work. Sure. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's it, it, when it comes to the stock market, there's a lot of stuff that happens. So every participant in the market is there for its own particular reason. Uh, starting from people who go into the market so that they can make a long term investment so that they can have more money in the future. Right. At the most basic level to fight inv like in inflation. There's a lot of reasons why you won't need to have stock brokers or traders for it um the, the the a large number of those roles are going to go away slowly but surely or are going to be reduced and 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 be coexist but there's a lot of other participants that that start uh appearing in different time scales we say look i don't care what happens to amazon in the long term i care what happens to amazon between today at 9 30 a.m and 4 p.m when the market closes i could care less about what you know, like quarterly earnings are next week or whatever. I'm in this for for these standard deviations and you know statistical moves and stuff. And so uh, for that stuff, you do need brains. And then you have then you have other creative processes. Like, look, I'm not a stockbroker, but I I program ideas into the computer for these algorithms. The computer trades on my behalf, but I still need to creatively feed these ideas, right? I still need to create these quantitative uh, uh, models. Uh, to come up with this. And then you have new things that come up, like Wall Street Bets, for example, created its own new niche of participants. This idea where you have like these armies of apes that go in there and just like buy these out of the money stock options and push stock prices around like crazy. And these short squeeze, like, you know, thanks to Robinhood and other stuff, like that's a new strategy. This actually meme stocks, that's what I'm referring to. That's an actual strategy there's lots of people now that have that have turned meme stocks into a, a replicatable uh, sustainable strategy so i think that people still need to drive stuff uh but i think the computers are going to help things faster like i can see a world by which you can have a computer facilitate the amount of work that a lot of people do so that you can get it done faster yeah and better such that the rest of your day or week can then be used in one of two ways. Well, either with leisure, which I consider to be productive, which is, hey, you did your work, you can go home and have fun, be with your family, enjoy, be healthy, go to the gym, or do more work, right? Be more productive, make more money, whether it be the same company or some additional work, both of which are productive. So, you know, you've now been able to, to, to produce more stuff with your time thanks to these things. Super fascinating stuff, Jamie. And I feel like we could go for hours and hours and hours on these topics. Uh, endlessly fascinating, very much a disruptive time in human history. I'm going to ask you some rapid fire questions, Jamie, but, but before we get into the rapid fire, tell us where's the best way for us to connect with you? Twitter's the best way to get me directly because all these other social media uh, platforms sometimes have intermediaries. So at Wall Street Bets with uh, the three words spelled out. Uh, is, is the best way to connect. My DMs are open and uh, uh, yeah, that's that's the best way. At Wall Street Bets on Twitter. Mm -hmm. At Wall Street Bets, got it. That's the brand, baby. At Wall Street Bets. This is, 
uh, Jamie Rokosinski. So, uh, Jamie, you ready for the rapid fire? Let's do it. Let's rock and roll, Jamie. What's the scariest movie you've ever seen? Hmm, I don't think I've seen a scary movie before. Maybe, I don't know, It? Yep, good one. Bold prediction, in 10 years, is Bitcoin going to be worth more or less $100,000 in 10 years? More. Yeah, I'm with you there. What about Ethereum? Ethereum over under 100K in 10 years? Under. Under. NFTs, overrated, underrated? Under, but not in their current form. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a they're, quick. They're still, they're, st- they're still being perfected. What, what's the best way to use a, an NFT? I mean, the same way, but similar way, but there's still like this 10,000 number, this, you got to give your community like lined up, put some random utility thing on it. Like they're going to tweak the little formula on it and they're going to do it. The best use I've seen so far, far was for the Australian Open um, uh, tennis match. It was a very, like not very heard of what they did and it wasn't making a lot of noise, but it was the most brilliant use of an NFT that I've ever seen anybody done. You'll have to look it up so that I don't take up too much of your rapid fire time. Interesting. Love it. Uh, if you could sit next to anyone on a plane, who'd you sit next to? Elon Musk. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would you live? Mm, Galapagos Island. Ooh, I like Galapagos. Some wild animals there. Uh, final question here for you, Jamie. This may be an easy one, but if you had 10 seconds with yourself 10 years ago, what would you say? <laughs> trademark earlier <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to you'll have to ask me this question again in like two years and i'll give you a different one but right now that would be my advice to freaking trademark <laughs> trademark better love it uh jamie thanks for being here today yeah. wall street bets everyone Ear- earlier yeah yeah and in the, the books below check out wall street bets the book it is online for sale link below wall street bets jamie thanks brother thanks a lot Yo, thanks for listening to today's episode. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. I will catch you here next time on the After Hours Entrepreneur. Now it's your turn. Go take action, baby. You learned. Now it's a good time to take the action. I'll catch you next time here on the show. Peace.